Jonathan in Tallahassee, how are you? Hi, I'm doing well. Can you hear me all right? I can, thanks. All right, so um, I'm a Christian, and I'm calling uh, to better understand uh, the atheist worldview with respect to the scientific method. There isn't and, one. And so... There, there, there isn't one, Jonathan. We'll start there. Yeah, so atheism isn't a worldview. Um, it's a position on a single issue, and that's whether or not a god exists. However, once you get to that point, and you're now a, a person who is uh, living a life uh, without interference from gods, um, you then have to begin to put together worldviews that allow you to uh, assess the reality that you experience. And so what you'll find is that there are quite a lot of atheists who share uh, similar views about you know, science and, and things like that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the case. For example, Buddhists are primarily atheists, and they have a number, in some of the Buddhist sects, have a number of you know, supernatural ideas that I reject. And so I'm a skeptic, and that's what drives my atheism. I'm applying skepticism and critical thinking to the God claim, and I apply that to others as well, but um, skepticism and humanism are far more along the lines of what I would call my worldview uh, than atheism. Atheism is just my, my take on the God thing. You could be an atheist okay. and not support church-state separation. So in respect to then, I guess I would say a, a skeptic, um, would you say that you use the scientific method to determine if you know, there is evidence for a claim, correct? To some extent. I mean, it's not like there. Th this is where the language gets kind of muddy because when you start talking about the scientific method, um, right. it, it may be an oversimplification. Basically, we're using critical thinking and right. skepticism and evaluating the evidence in the best way possible, which tends to revolve around the tools that are commonly used by science. Which, science is really just... Uh, a rational, critical examination of evidence and attempting to build models and hypotheses that explain those. So I guess I, I really only want to ask the question if, you know, if most atheists take, take to the scientific, you know, method of determining if something's rational or not. I mm -hmm. mean, is that, that's pretty common, correct, that for atheists to look to that method to determine if something is rational or irrational, correct? I, I would say it's pretty common. I would hope that it'd be a hell of a lot more common than it seems to be. <laughs> okay. So I, I want to bring up a problem that I see with trusting that method for, you know, for evidence. Is that something we can talk about? Sure. Um, but you, and I don't necessarily want to, you know, pull an end around, but the thing is that Science doesn't lead to proofs to absolute certainty. Science right. develops tentative positions that are the best current explanations for the evidence. And so it's not right. so much a pronouncement of truth. It's this particular model and theory is the one that has withstanded the, the most rigorous examination and is the one that seems to be most consistent with the evidence and the one that actually makes predictions that have been continually borne out and hasn't failed. So, so in this case, this is where I get kind of interested when you make that statement, because when you look at, for example, the ancient texts, the Holy Bible, um, the New Testament books, um, can, can you not say that they withstanded the test of time and that today um, people look to those for some sort of rationalization um, well, about, about their world? Do you think that looking to the ancient text is maybe not as important for some reason, and could you give that reason as looking to a scientific method? Okay, so those ancient religious texts have definitely uh, stood the test of time in the sense that they still exist and that people still, uh, as you pointed out, go to or look to them um, for rationalizations which was actually your word. Uh, I, I don't even know that it's all rationalizations. I can say that these, these books have been around. They have been valuable to people uh, for whatever reason. 
but they are not a reliable pathway. So, like, for example, let's say that, that the Bible gave us some piece of information that we didn't have at the time. Right. Um, and it turned out to be, I, I, I'm reluctant to use the word true, but reliable and good and accurate. Um, it doesn't matter at all. It, didn't be, it wasn't reliable until we verified its reliability right. using the critical examination of evidence. So it didn't really inform us of anything. Um, and, but what you could do is you could look at it and say, okay, how many things did it get right? How many things did it get wrong? But you can't, let's say it got 99 things wrong, right. Does that mean that the next thing that you read in there is actually right too? Right. No, yeah. I mean, that it wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be true, uh, even if it was all written by a single individual, which it, which it wasn't. So right. yeah. I, I don't see any reason to um, go to an old book for answers. Um, right. Go well, ahead. I think what I wanted to ask, you know, in relation to what you just, the statements you just made is that, you know, if we look at uh, scientific discoveries in the next hundred years, uh, for example, you could take the Higgs boson particles, you know much of what they're doing with the particle accelerator and whatnot. I don't want to talk about something that maybe you don't know about or... Uh, I know enough to know that they got a Nobel Prize and I don't know what, I don't yeah. know, I, when you say what they're doing with it, I don't know that they're actually doing anything with it at the moment. Uh, right. Well, they're, they're trying to um, compare what they found to an actual scientific model so that it kind of makes sense to them. And, and the, the thing I wanted to, to bring up based on that is that I see that scientific discovery continues to, to change. And, of course, a new discovery replaces an old one. And over the years, it's just... It doesn't you know, ne it, not necessarily replace. Sometimes it, it's just amends or improves our understanding. It's not like... Right, we, so, we necessarily I, I toss out everything. Yeah, I can agree there. Uh, it amends, and it, sometimes it can change quite a bit. Uh, and so, you know, over the years, as it continues to change, is it, is it not the same as, you know, taking in, into account the ancient texts and how today... No, because the ancient texts don't change. That's the, that's the difference. Religion right. is static, and science is dynamic. That's, I mean, there's no progress when you assert that you know the answer from the beginning. Religion retards progress. The only reason that, that uh, I give, you know, religions any credit for advancing science is that in order to help spread their religion, many religions were responsible for building places of higher learning that allowed and in some cases encouraged scientific exploration and in many cases discouraged scientific exploration. I mean, we need to look no further than Galileo and what the church did to him. So it, it sounds like to me that it would be for an atheist to, to even consider looking to an ancient text, as in the Holy Bible, um, uh, as, as an irrational you know, way to interpret their world, as opposed to looking at you know, the way, even though science uh, is dynamic and continually is going to change, that would be a more viable you know, source of how you'd want to look at your world. And th would that make sense? Well, that, that, that'd I, be the that, method. You see, the, one of the things is that you can examine the claims, whether they come from an old book or right. a new observation. And so we can examine, for example, the, the claims in the Bible and see if they, uh, you know, bear out scientifically. Uh, they don't, or they don't tend to, uh, in any remarkable sense. Um, okay. So, so the last, the last thing I wanted to, or kind of like an analogy I wanted to make was, um, you know, for example, going back to the discovery of, you know, the Higgs boson supposedly particle or, and whatnot, uh, as they're trying to apply it to one of their scientific models, um, is it not that, you know, they, they didn't invent the original particles, as in, I don't want to, I'll say they didn't cause or create uh, the original particles that they're testing. And it, it kind of makes me think about the movie The Matrix where, you know, someone is on the outside looking in who does know how the original particles were caused or created. 
um, and that's where the real knowledge is located. And so, in the in the case of um, looking to the Holy Bible or the ancient text um, for an understanding of your world, how could you not know um, if you didn't try? And that's kind of where I've been going as far as you know, un- understanding why you know an atheist would reject. That why why wouldn't you at least try to look for some answers? Okay, so they, so first of all, I don't know what makes you think that atheists haven't tried. You do maybe you don't realize. I was a fundamentalist Christian for more than twenty five years and was studying to become a minister. So it's not just okay. a matter of trying. I actively believed those things. I gave them up because the evidence did not support continue. It just it wasn't rational to continue believing those things. Um, now you're you're looking at this as if. Oh, the Bible could be viewed as um, the, the story from the person standing outside looking in. Um, well, you have no good reason to think that that's actually the case. Um, I don't know how you're distinguishing between that being the case and some other holy text being the case. But the other one is um, you've already made an assumption that could be fundamentally false, which is that there's any way for anything to be outside looking in. There may not be any outside, and, and if there is an outside, that doesn't mean it can contain a thinking agent. And even if it does, that doesn't mean that that thinking agent is in any way responsible for the reality we experience. So you're just accepting a whole bunch of things and, and, and looking in there to try to find, uh, can, you know, let me, let me look through this and see if I can make science seem to fit with what the Bible's saying, and that's not scientific. So that, that, that leads me to a huge question, and it's, okay. you know, how do we truly know that something in this life that we didn't cause or create, you know, is, is impossible or is not? You know, it, it, I don't, it I don't know makes, what you mean. Well, well, let me try to rephrase the question. So, you know, you, you're saying that I'm making an assumption, and, and I agree there, uh, but in, in that case, can you not assume that, you know, the, the, the science that, you know, maybe an atheist would look to to understand their world um, is, is really, they're really knowing nothing. They're, they're getting nothing from it. It's kind of like the, the quote, um, I know that I know nothing. Um, I don't know if you've heard that quote, but... I, I'm, kinda, af- I'm afraid I still don't know what you're actually getting at. So, let, let's back up to... Um, my analogy, uh, you know, from the outside looking in on a on a scientific discovery, for example. Um, Outs- and outside of what? From, as in, <laughs> so I-, I was talking about a scientific discovery, the Higgs boson supposed particle, and um, from from there I said, well, they think they've discovered something, but because we didn't cause or create those particles that they're testing. They really can't 100% know, right? That um, that they've really discovered something. No, they. So, well, so I, I, apart from the issue of, of solipsism and whether you can absolutely know anything, um, mm-hmm. they're as confident that they actually discovered something uh, in this case as they are with pretty much any other discovery. Right. And so I, I okay. guess. I feel like that's what my art, my not my argument, but my question and my my wondering boils down to is, um, you know, a hundred percent knowing. You're not, that, I, what are you? Gonna, you're not going to. So this idea of hundred percent certainty is pretty much a useless red herring. There's virtually nothing that we know with hundred percent certainty, outside okay. of esoteric labels and things like that. Um, logical absolutes, there's nothing that you're going to get 100% certainty about this. This is the problem of hard solipsism. You can't prove that you're not right. in the matrix. You can't prove you're not a brain of that. Um, right. Although I, I tend to think that there's good arguments against that, uh, not the least of which is that it would be incredibly arrogant of me to presume that I've written in my head every great song and great poem and, uh, you know, and also all the crappy ones, too. Uh, you know. <laughs> So it, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's more plausible, and, and as a matter of practical necessity, I have to act as if there are other minds because that's what I directly experience. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what the problem is with this absolute certainty because, first of all, um, atheism isn't necessarily the claim that there are no gods, and it's certainly not, even to the extent that it is, um, for some, it's not the claim that we're absolutely certain that there are no gods. 
Um, right. It's about what, which beliefs are justified. And what I think you were talking about a minute ago was, you know, you, you acknowledge that you're making an assumption and you don't see what the problem is with that. And the problem is that in order to be intellectually honest, you would have to make, or consistent, you would have to make similar assumptions for other similar categories, which would put you in a position of cognitive dissonance where you are simultaneously accepting contradictory and mutually exclusive claims. If, if you have no good justification, for example, for believing that the God of the Bible exists, then that's, if you're going to be intellectually consistent, you have to have to apply that justification, and I put that in scare quotes, to every other God that comes along, which means you would need to believe all of them too. And if you're only right. going to believe one as opposed to the others, now you're engaged in a big old fallacy of special pleading. And so right. the, the intellectually honest thing is to reject all of those and say, I do not believe any of these until one of them meets good standards of evidence. And, and right. b belief should be reserved until that happens. And so that kind of goes into something else. I mean, the standard of evidence that you, you, know, you just mentioned there, well, I mean, would you say the standard of evidence is you know, uh, subjective to the ancient text, as in it says, if you trust, or it says believe, but you know, in the Greek, believe and trust mean the same thing. Uh, if, if you trust and you know, you'll have eternal life or you'll have a new life, right, in Christ. Um, so, you know, but at the same time, you're looking at it from a different perspective of uh, your, maybe your own rational methods, correct? Mm -hmm. Instead of, um, you know, taking it for, um, you know, what it's, how it's asking you to accept it, as in uh, it's asking you to distrust each day, right? So, I, I don't know, that, that's where I feel like the conversation would well, go. As so, a, so you, my concern is that, that people might think that this is a good idea or that this is a no-risk proposition. Oh, I'm just going to trust that, you know, I have an afterlife. Well, I care whether or not we actually do have an afterlife. Um, I can't possibly believe it until I have good reason to do so. This, this trust that you're talking about is kind of akin to uh, literally blind faith. And believing something with no good reason at all. And right. when you, beliefs don't live in a vacuum, they live in your brain. And every belief you have potentially affects other beliefs you're going to make and other decisions you make. And so if you've right. made this decision for really bad reasons, you may be in a position where you are more likely to make similar decisions based on similar bad reasoning. And while your belief in an afterlife may or may not have a dramatic effect on your life, those others might. So, but, but my thing is, even, even if I were to really want to or somehow try to convince myself to trust that this is the case, there's enough stuff that is just absolutely wrong with the Bible that it's not just, it's not like, oh, there's a whole bunch of claims here and I don't know whether to believe them. Um, there are claims there that are just immoral and false and outrageous and absurd. And if I will, for example, if I die and I find that I'm standing in front of some God and it turns out that he's the God represented in the Bible, the first thing I'm going to want to ask is, does the Bible accurately reflect your character and wishes? Because if it does, I don't want anything to do with you. Because that's a book that, you know, I, I say it almost every week now, sanctions slavery. I mean, as this is what God says is okay, doesn't ever correct that, doesn't come back and say, you know, when Jesus shows up, he doesn't say, hey, by the way, all that stuff that you guys thought we, that God meant about slavery, you got that wrong, and you really shouldn't own people as property, and you really shouldn't buy and sell people, and you really shouldn't beat them, uh, you know, as long as they don't die within a couple of days. There's no correction along those lines. And, you know, I've gone through the Sermon on the Mount and done a verse-by-verse -verse deconstruction to show which verses are good evidence, which verses are good um, uh, statements, and which ones are bad or harmful. Um, you know, there's... It, yeah, it, I mean, it, it seems inconsistent with, with who God is throughout the entirety of Scripture for what, him what, to... What pro, seems inconsistent? Pro, promote, for him to promote uh, any sort of slavery. No, it doesn't. Uh, that's I, that's I the point. I haven't looked... I personally haven't looked into those scriptures. I mean, from what I, from from one thing, I do understand that I think that that an atheist 
in his in their mind maybe doesn't see is that in order for good to uh, to persevere and for um, basically people who uh, were what burning their children and and committing you know things that were, were obviously against God's you know wishes and, and, and commands uh, there, there was no choice but for certain people to no longer be and for other people to continue to be oh really and so so you the infinite at the 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 eternal all-wise all-powerful creator of the universe can find no other better solution than to send a band of thugs to kill the people who don't like him well no you can't put it that way now you've got to look into it for, for, for you, what it you really just is. said that this is it, what had uh, to happen well we're also getting into a, a bit of a free will thing at this point to really be honest because the of, a, of a human being look uh, look how could you look, say that the heart is look, going to change right look <laughs> look if if you're god and you're writing your commandments wouldn't you write don't own other people as property and if you didn't if that was an oversight would you ever encourage them to write down that, as a matter of fact, you can and should, and here's who you should enslave, and here's how much you should pay for them? I mean, the Bible doesn't just, like, overlook this. It gets it exactly backward. And if your argument is that it was necessary uh, for them to enslave other people on the planet because, I don't know, they were immoral and didn't like God, um, then that makes that's kind of a weak God, first of all, and an immoral one. Because uh, if you're going to give people the free will that you seem to think is necessary here, uh, and then you want to extract punishment for them exercising it in the wrong way, how free is that? Yeah, I, I think you, you have a point to an extent, I would say. <laughs> because I, I feel like we've reached into the whole idea of free will, to me personally, is a very mysterious subject. And to try to say that that's, that God, you know, you can just you can't just throw out there, in my opinion, that God, you know, gave them free will, and then He knew what they were going to do, and then you know because of that, you know, He comes back and and has to punish them. Like it's, I just don't think we can wrap our minds around that process. Well, of, I, I I think we can will. a little bit. I think we can a little bit. So for to, example, to an extent, so to for an for extent, example, yeah. for example, Jonathan, do you believe that God created everything? I believe he created every natural thing, yes. Okay. Um, do you believe that he had decisions about what kind of universe he could create, or was this the only one? Um, I'm sure he had decisions, yeah. Okay. Do you believe that he has foreknowledge of the future, perfect foreknowledge, knows what's going to happen later on? Yes, I'd say yes. Okay, then under that model, those three things, you cannot also claim that we have free will, because that specific set of three items a deity who created the universe knowing what would happen and having choices of other universes to potentially create that means that god necessarily created this universe and specifically chose the universe in which this set of decisions would be made he specifically chose the universe in which i would end up as an atheist or at least be an atheist at my current age who knows where i'll end up um, and and every single decision that, there's okay. no free will in that model. Yeah, uh, as I said, I, I don't feel like I have a definition for free will. Um, I do believe that... I don't think know, there's a definition of free will that matches any... You, you can twist it up pretty good, and you're not going to get over that. Yeah, I, 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 and I, I, on the subject, I just I, I can't say much uh, about it. But from, from what I understand, uh, you know, I, I, I really do agree with with those who would say you know slavery is inconsistent with 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 who god is what 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 how can they possibly say that if the only thing that we know of what god reportedly is is this book that describes his character and pr portrays what his commandments are what his wishes are how could anybody possibly claim this is that this is inconsistent i mean people try to claim that no. also try to claim that um you know that uh, he's just a loving God. Well, the entire Old Testament is pretty much a comedy of God's errors and anger. He creates two people, sticks them in a garden in the most absurd situation, says, don't eat from this tree. Um, I realize that this was, he was probably a first-time parent in this scenario, but
but I don't think, I think even the dumbest parent would know what was going to happen there. And so he has to punish them and exile them. And then the, the whole world goes to hell shortly thereafter. And so he picks out, you know, the most righteous man and his family and decides to build a ridiculous boat, which isn't seaworthy and couldn't hold all the animals. And then he's going to flood and kill everything except for this family, uh, at least if you go for a global flood, which we know scientifically just is absurd. And no other civilization seemed to notice this global flood. So it must have been a local flood, which doesn't actually solve the problem of sin. And then right after Noah, you've got a couple hundred years where they do this massive population growth and they're building a Tower of Babel, which I don't know why a god would be, a, you know, even the slightest bit bothered. This was clearly the mindset of these, these ancient people that God lived somewhere up in the sky, um, even though, you know, modern theologians say, no, that's not it at all, because clearly we can, you know, travel to the moon. Uh, I don't know if we wave to God on the way past. And that fails and falls apart. And so then God decides instead of trying to save everybody, he's just going to pick out his one favorite tribe. Uh, who happened to be enslaved, and I'm pretty sure they should have realized that there was a problem with slavery, um, and goes through this incredible scenario of we're going to give all these plagues, and every time Pharaoh wants to actually let them go, God comes down and specifically hardens his heart so that he can show off a bit more. I'm, oh, no, 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 I want you to let him go, but I'm not going to let you make that. He violated Pharaoh's free will. It's explicitly there. Yeah, no, no, Pharaoh, he hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he couldn't do it, gets all the plagues out of the way, then these three million Jews, for which is no evidence that they were ever enslaved in Israel or in, in uh, Egypt, there's no you know, commingling of, of, and by the way, if they held hand to hand, the number of Jews that were there, they could have stretched from Egypt to Canaan in the first place. They're led across you know, all these miracles and everything else. Miracles that would wow anybody living today they right. get to the Mount Ararat. Moses is gone for 40 days, and those guys say, ah, screw that God. We'll make another one. This guy can't do anything right. And yet he specifically chose this universe where he knew he was going to have to keep failing and keep killing and keep failing and keep killing until he picked out his little special group and sent them around to keep failing and keep killing. And then there's this empty period and he decides, you know what, I'm going to take human form, come down, sacrifice myself to myself to act as a loophole for rules that I created that I can't circumvent. I mean, it is logically absurd. Yeah, I think the, the one thing that, uh, that I think can help you with an understanding of it uh, would basically be, you know, if, if you've ever seen the show The Walking Dead, I don't know if you've seen it, there's one episode where they catch, you know, a zombie and he's in this barn, and uh, they're basically keeping him in there. And, uh, you know, I, I don't remember how the show turns out, but basically what, what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make from this is that if you were a father and, you know, there, there's someone who's, who, who's obviously has an evil intent and, um, you know, you, you put them in chains or you put them in a jail somewhere, you know, to, to keep them from, you know, exploiting that evil intent on others, uh, then, then you can see a reasonable point to doing that, to keeping the person in jail. Um, uh, now, this isn't I, jail. This isn't jail. I'm not, no, I'm not. We're almost, we're almost completely out of time, and I'm just not going to allow this. This isn't jail we're talking about. This, it specifically says owning another human being as property that you can pass on to your children. That part's in Deuteronomy. You don't get to c come back kind of after the fact. I have one last question because we're almost out of time. How did okay. you determine that God is the good one and Satan is the evil one? How did I determine that God is the good one and Satan is the evil one? Uh, I don't, I don't know if I ever mentioned that. I'm not sure why no. you're asking. But. Well, you 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 keep arguing that you know that, that basically there's this God who's trying to do the good stuff. Um, it, it, do you believe that God is the good one and Satan is the evil one? Um, I believe that Satan made a became Satan because he made a bad choice. But I'm not. I mean. He influences evil. He likes evil. Um, how, how, how did you figure out that he, well, we're, we're completely out of time. They're putting the credits up. I got to let you go, Jonathan. Thanks for the call. Uh, maybe right. try again next week uh, and think All about right. how you figured out God's the good one because uh, I, don't, I don't see the justification for that, especially when you list off the things that are supposedly in his character. But he loves me, but he doesn't seem to show it in any way other than murder and mayhem.